And you know, the most important thing, if we're thinking about work, is not just simply, you know, should I, should I seek to be a dental technician, or should I seek to be an accountant, or should I seek to be a nurse? Obviously, that's something that comes into play for all of us. But the bigger picture is this. I mean, sometimes, and a lot of times, I think we just need to step back and take in the big picture. What, what is God like when it comes to work? I mean, what can we tell from the way God designed things? What can we tell? Just, just for instance, e- even though I specifically tonight, I'll tell you right up, Next week, we're going to look at work and probably not every feasible thing that pertains to it from the book of Proverbs, but we're going to try. Next week, we want to just simply go to Proverbs. But you know, one of the things that the writer of Proverbs says is consider the ant. Well, do that. Just consider the ant. I mean, I literally, where I... Where I live, if you just if you go, mm, it's it's probably 150 yards from my house, northeast, out into the field, kind of right across from where Richard lives, towards the railroad tracks over there. There is a patch of ground, probably about this big, that is bare. It doesn't have anything growing green in that patch and the thing is it's in the middle of a field of grass well I know you could live in Texas long enough we didn't see that where I grew up in Michigan but that's that's ants carpenter ants and they keep that circle absolutely free of anything growing and you know what if you watch them they have a trail they have trails that go off in a number of different directions And sometimes I go out in that field to walk and pray, and I'll get down there by that thing, and I'll follow one of their paths. And it goes way out there. And those things are coming, and they're going back and forth and back and forth. And the ones that go out, go out empty. And the ones that come back in, they've got something. And you know, the thing about ants is you can have a colony of these tiny little ants. Just, have you ever seen the real tiny little ones that like move real fast? But if those guys are going at it, they can, they can create a mound of dirt in an amazing amount of time. And you know the interesting thing about them? Every day, they go to work at the same time. I mean, they shut down. They shut down for the night. There's a time when they quit working. And there's a time when they start. And you could pretty much set your clock by it, just like the bees. I mean, I, I, I have a crazy peach tree that blooms in January. And I thought, and it was really cold. And I thought, oh, my tree, it blooms in January when there's no bees. And you know, if you don't have any bees, you don't get pollination. And so I looked up, I Googled it, and it said, bees become active at I think it was 52 degrees Fahrenheit. So I'd go to the weather thing and I'd watch that thing come up, 48 degrees. And where I sit right at my desk because I look out over the field, I got a pair of binoculars there. Every once in a while I'd grab them and I'd look at my tree. And sure enough, when, when I clicked the weather and it said 52, I said, hey, and I grabbed hold of those things and I looked down there and sure enough, there were honeybees working on that tree. I, those those ants keep going. Ever since I've lived there, I've lived there six years, that colony has been there for that long. And those guys are working. Undoubtedly, the ants that were there six years ago, that these are their descendants. But look, I, I mean, just think with me here. God created ants to work. And He created bees to work. Have you, ever, have you ever just, a lot of you have had a cat. You ever notice how cats work to keep themselves clean? I mean, you, you, you know one thing we saw when we were just recently in Colorado? 
my family and the lighters, we, we were up at this, uh, up at this pass, and uh, we climbed up in these mountains, and uh, on the way up, there was a pond out in the middle of this field in the mountains made by a beaver. And Joshua and I went over there, and you can't believe it. There was just a, there was an open meadow in these mountains, and literally a beaver had the closest woods were like way up around. That beaver had to go up into those woods and pull down all this wood and mud and literally built a wall across this meadow, which had a slant to it because it was in the mountains, literally built a wall and created the pond and then created a home in the pond. God creates animals to work. And you know the things about animals? That little ant down there, you can't hardly think, has a, has a mind. It's not thinking. It can't worship. It can't think. It can't will It's basically, I mean, we don't know how they think. We don't know what's going on with these things. But there's instinct, and they do it. And here's here's a thing that's said about us that isn't said about those things. What's true of us? We were created what? What's that? What is the greatest possible, imaginable thing that the Bible says about the way we were created. In the image of God. We were created in the image of God. And now, follow this. When we were created, what did God create us to do? I mean, you just think about this. God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish Now here's the thing, we have dominion. So we have been given dominion over the fish of the sea and over birds of the heavens and over the livestock, over the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Over the earth, the metals that are in the earth, the animals that are in the earth, the plants that are in the earth, the oceans that are upon the earth, the fish that are in the sea. We've been given dominion. So God created man in His own image, in the image of God. He created him, male and female. He created him, created them, and God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth. And here it is too, subdue it. Not only have dominion over it, but subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And if you think about it, what happened? God worked. And God worked for six days and then God rested. And so much are we to be in that image that the same work-rest structure that He worked and rested by is actually the same structure instituted for our time here on earth, right? We have seven day weeks. A seven day week didn't happen by chance. It happened by God's design. You know, we've kind of, we've kind of adjusted to this mindset in America that we work five days and then we have two off. Right, Jonathan? You like to have two days off? You young guys, I know you have lots of crazy hours, but that's typically, that's typically the mindset. You work five days, five day work week, you have two off. But that wasn't the way it was in the beginning, right? God created and worked for six days and then there was a day of rest. And so when man comes along, that same kind of work and rest rotation, that cycle, is certainly what man has followed. A seven-day work week, even when the Mosaic Law was given down, resting one day, We see that. And we were made in the image. God created. And in His image, we're creators. Not like He is. He can create something out of nothing. But men, don't they have, as they're seeking to subdue wood, they like to turn it into a birdhouse. They seek to subdue wood. They turn it into 
a rocking chair. They seek to subdue wood. They turn it into a house. Now God, He makes something out of nothing. We make something out of the things that have already been created as we subdue. But this is exactly what He told our first father and mother to do. Have dominion and subdue. And so that was the work that was given to them. You basically have dominion over this whole world and all the minerals, all the rocks, all the life, animal and plant. You have dominion over it. Subdue it. I mean, come in and rule over it. And have it serve you. I mean, that's what dominion is, right? You have it to serve you. Have it serve you for your good. You can eat it. You can use it. Here, I'm making you ruler over over all of it. And that was their work. Dominion, subduing. They had a garden that they lived in. I don't know how much, you know, I don't know how much work they actually did there before the curse. You had a lot of trees, probably, you know, it's like, is it kind of like people even today that live down around the, the equator? You know, in some of those South Pacific islands, it's like nobody hardly has to do anything. You got banana, papaya trees, you got all the coconut trees, they're just bearing fruit all the time. And there's fish just virtually leaping out of the ocean. I mean, you know, fish a little, pick, pluck a few fruit. And some of those places, you hardly have to do anything. Some of the most wicked places, the severest darkness of cannibals and headhunters, amazing, they come from these places that are nigh into the greatest paradise situations on the face of this earth. And then, you know, one of the ways that we really see that work is instituted from the beginning is because when Adam and Eve fell into sin, think about the curse. What was the curse on man? It wasn't on something that wasn't already in practice. What I mean by that is this. Women already were created by God to bear children. Right? The the curse was that they would now bear children in pain. Work was already prescribed. The curse is that now it's by the sweat of your brow. And now this earth out here, this soil, is not going to be so friendly to you. It's going to bear all manner of weeds and thorns and briars and thicket and thistle and biting, pokey, prickly thing. Right? Texas is especially cursed that way. It just seems like... You know, I, I can remember, you know, Craig and I, we were laughing that we, we heard of this place down here. You know, we come from Michigan where there's, it's, it's maple land. I, I mean, I lived in a city that had a maple lake. There were maples, all manner of kinds of maples that turned all sorts of beautiful colors in the fall and in the spring. And uh, we heard that there's a place down here called Lost Maples. And my family and I, we went there about 10 years ago, it seems like. And uh, I was telling Craig about it. And he said, really, what, what's it like? And I said, Craig, even the maple trees here like have thorns on the, on the leaves. But, I mean, that's, that's the curse. Truly it is. And notice what the curse, just like with the woman, it was pointed at what the man did. What he was designed to do. And it is its work. And, and so you see this, you see this in the beginning. You see God worked. We were created in His image. You see that God worked six days, rested one. When the Mosaic law is given, six days are for working. One is for resting. We're created in God's image to work as He worked, to rest as He rest. And and really, what the curse did is it didn't bring work. Some people look at at work like. Oh, it's a curse. No, it's not a curse. It's fulfilling. And one thing you find is that, you know, what the, you know what a curse is? A curse for a fish is if you take it out of water and throw it on 150 degree sizzling hot black asphalt pavement. That's a curse to that bird or to that fish. Why? Because you're taking it out of what, its element. You're removing it from what it was designed to be and to do. You throw it in the water, 
you know, it's a saltwater fish and it's there in salt water, it's very content. It's what it's made to do and be and it goes on with its life. This is just like a hummingbird. Those things work. You ever seen those things? I mean, the bees, the ants, the beavers, the, these animals, God created them to work. And work is not a curse. It's what's designed into them. It wasn't like, it wasn't like the bees didn't do that before the curse. Not like all of a sudden the curse brought work to everything. That's what they were designed to do. And when we, that's, certainly it's not cursed if that's what God did. Not if he works for six days and rests one. Certainly nothing cursed about it. It's good. That is in the nature of God to create, to make, to work, to act. And that certainly is one of the aspects that he designed into us. So, I, I feel, you know, we always want to go back to the Genesis account. We always want to think about creation because that really does take us to the essentials, to the very essence of how God created things. And you know, as with everything, it, you, know, you know one of the things I, I can remember as a young Christian um, reading somewhere, now I've never read the Koran. I don't think I've read one word out of the Koran. Um, I don't think I've ever had an English Koran in my hands. If I did, I'd probably read a few lines at least. But I've never had it there. But I can remember as a young Christian, um, I can remember as a young Christian something that is said in the Quran about creation. Have you read it cover to cover? And and I, I just remember some of these some of these um, somebody was comparing the religious writings between different religions, and I forget which one it is that says, and I think it's Islam actually, that the world was created on the back of elephants. Well, that's foolishness. That's ridiculous. That absolutely is not true. The, the amazing thing about the Word of God is that it's true. I mean, have you ever noticed that? It says there's none good, no, not one. And by nature, you look around and dealt with that text a little bit on Sunday. But you know it's true. When you look around, wars and rumors of wars. Grab the newspaper. It's like this book, what it says is true. And you know, when this book says that God created us in His image, and He is a God that works. And it being created in His image, work is a good thing. And work is something that we ought to be doing. It's something that designed into the fabric of who we are in the image of God. And we're supposed to work six days and rest one. And that, was, that, was, that pattern was laid down not only at creation, but then again, that same kind of pattern reiterated there in the Mosaic Law. What you find when you look around is people who are idle tend to be the most suicidal. People who are idle and on welfare and they just lay around and they're lazy, they have a tendency to be the most depressed, the most criminal. It's not a good thing to not work. Have you ever noticed that? It does not make people feel good who don't work. It doesn't make them feel fulfilled. It makes them feel empty. It makes them feel useless, worthless. Have you ever noticed that? I mean, welfare. People that are on welfare, it, it is no advantage to them. It is not a help to them. Have you ever, know, have you ever met anybody who's chronically lazy, who's really happy and full of joy. I haven't. Never. Not once. I don't know a single person like that. Right? I, I mean, it's, it's the way God designed us. And you know, you can take a lot of lost people who aren't living for Christ, but they work. They, they've, a lot of times they become obsessed with work. But it brings a measure of fulfillment. They're busy. They're active. They're producing things. I mean, that's satisfying. There's something satisfying. I find it to be so. Something satisfying. So this is something we certainly don't want to shy away from. And of course, when we get to the New Testament, where my brother's going to take us right now, 
Um, the New Testament isn't silent about work at all. Amen. Uh, the New Testament is filled with uh, examples of that. Uh, in fact, if you, um, if you turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, Starting with verse 6. So as Pastor Tim was just speaking about idleness, it says, Now we command you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from any brother who is walking in idleness and not in accord with the tradition that you receive from us. So first off, we, we see here we, we have a command. And he didn't. He, he he could have just said, "Now we command you, brothers." But adding emphasis in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that this this command has the authority, apostolic authority, as well as the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ Himself, that you keep away from any brother who is walking in idleness. Now we know that when church discipline takes place, we're to keep away from those who are under the church discipline. And we're to do that, we're to deliver them over to Satan so that they may prayerfully repent. They may feel the, the fangs of the world, that they may feel the claws of the evil one and come running back under the, the authority and the, the grace of the Lord into the church. But it's interesting here that we're also told to stay away, keep away from any brother who is walking in idleness well, what, again, what, what, what is idleness? What, what, is that, what does that look like? Say it again. Not doing anything. Some people just sit at home all day and watch TV. Some people just, they play sports all day. Now, would that be considered idleness? They would say, well, I'm, I'm doing something. I'm, I'm working out my body. I'm doing some I'm not just sitting on a log doing nothing what do you think brother about idleness I think it's bad <laughs> Amen. yeah well to to uh well can I just I'll just stick in here that you know in a little in a little ways from here it says this is the one that we always like to quote right if somebody's not willing to work, they shouldn't what? Eat. Eat. Well, some people will want to conclude, well, I'm working enough to eat. But, you know, if you only focus on that verse, or that's the only one you ever hear, you may miss the point. The whole point is not just that you should just work barely enough to eat. The point is if you're not going to work enough to even have enough to eat, nobody else should be coming along and supporting you in that. But the, you don't want to miss the point here that it's not just making enough to eat, it's avoiding idleness. Be constructive in your life. Redeem the time. Work hard. Not just get by so that you can eat. That's not the point. That's missing the point. Idleness. I, I mean, I, look, idleness, who, who in the end is the, is the definition giver to, to what's in our Bibles? I mean, ultimately, it's God, right? And so you have to, you have to say, in the absolute sense, because idleness is his concept that he's giving to us in his word. Idleness, as defined by God, would certainly be, it, it, would, it would be being not involved in that which is profitable. It would be, 
it would be, it would to be in a state where the, even if I'm doing something like watching TV or playing sports, it's a waste of time. I'm not redeeming the time. You know what? There can be a time when I sit down in front of a television and it can be a redeeming of time. I'm wore out. I need some rest. There is a time to rest. There may be a time when, I know Spurgeon would say, there's times pastors need to get out of the study. You just need to go out and suck in some fresh air. And there's time that a good basketball game might be the most redeemable thing that I can do. So we don't want to be absolute in our judgments on what is or isn't profitable. It all has to do with, am I, you know, if I do sit down in front of the television, am I putting vain things, useless things before my eyes that have no value at all and maybe even are full of sin and destructive to me spiritually? Certainly, certainly the Lord doesn't want us doing that with our time. And am I becoming so obsessed with basketball that it's become an idol? And those are the kind of things to look at. Idleness would be falling into a state where we're giving ourselves to that which God looks at and says that's useless, that's empty, that's void of any eternal good. And spending so much of the, your time, and that's the, well we'll, well, well, we'll keep reading to get more of the context. Um, walking in idleness and not in accord with the, with the tradition that you receive from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us, because we were not idle when we were with you. Nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it, but with toil and labor we worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. So right there, the, this, this, they're setting forth the picture. They're setting forth the, the model and the example to imitate. And they even sacrificed something that he'll go on um, in verse 9. It was not because we did not have that right. We did have a right to eat the food that, we were <laughs> that, that you had. But to give you in ourselves an example to imitate. For even when we were with you, we would give you this command. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. So the example that is put forth by the apostles, that they did not walk in idleness, that they did not sit, and they're saying, look, we didn't do this. And Paul has said before, imitate me as I imitate Christ. We're to be examples among the flock, not just shepherds to be examples, but we're all to be examples to one another. We're supposed to spur one another on towards love and good works. Our behavior should be a poster of God's glory. Our behavior should be a picture of Christ's likeness. And Christ was not lazy. I, th I think that that would be a, uh, a another term that we can uh, emphasize here. This this laziness. The opposite of laziness is working hard, and that's that's extremely important. That we have an example of hard work, and this is what we are to imitate. There's a lot of people in the world that you can imitate, and even e even Christians who struggle with laziness, but we're not to imitate those men. We're not to imitate those people. We're to imitate those who work hard. And the fact that he would even sacrifice, and, and this, is, this is what Paul did. Paul gave up many rights before, right, um, for the sake of the gospel. So Paul is sacrificing his right to partake of the food that the believers were um, sharing so that they could be an example. He could be an example to the flock, to the men, so that they would not um, take this entitlement mentality. And that's a huge problem today. There's a huge issue of entitlement that I just feel like since you have it, I should be able to partake. 
now now there there's there, there's a reality that we are to share and uh, and and we're to have all things in common but this mentality that you have it I want it I deserve it therefore give it to me that's sin that's not something that we are to imitate that's not something we're to encourage that's not something we are to embrace I and mean, that's not something we're to do and Paul lays it down we did not take this entitlement thing though they had the right to eat because uh you know as as Paul said in was it first uh Timothy I'm not sorry first Corinthians about um not muzzling the ox thank you yes about not muzzling the ox is this for the ox's sake that this was written no those who work are worthy of their wages. Those who labor amongst you should receive. And Paul has that right, but he forgoes that right for something that is a bigger principle, and that is the principle of toil, of labor, of work. And he also said that we, not, we might not be a burden to any of you, we worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. It's a burden. We are, again, our, our country is burdened with people who do not want to work, people who do not have a desire to put their hands to the plow, so to speak, to put their hands, to find something to do with their mind, with their hands, with their talents, with their skills, to put it to use, put their feet to the pavement and go work, go find work. There's people who don't want to do that. And they do want, however, to receive the labor and the fruit of other people's work. And what is that to those who work? It's a burden. It, it, it's, it's, it's a burden where there are many people who share you know, you, you, you think of a, of, a, of, of a church where we are all gathering together and we want to use our resources to worship the Lord. And only a few people actually do that. Well, that puts more of a burden on those than those who don't. It's not that they don't have. It's not that they don't have this, this, these resources, but they're going to use it for, you know, their own means or their own desires and not share the load and it becomes a burden to the few who are doing it. And this is something that that Paul said, I will not partake in this. We did not use this right, nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it. Again, um, Pastor Tim has said it tonight. We see it. It's on the news. Some of us have family members that are like that. We see it. There are people who want to eat without paying for it. There are people who want to eat without working for it. You know, it's, it's one thing to be treated to a meal. It's another thing to expect it. And this, this mindset of entitlement, I deserve, I deserve. I had a hard life. Things are difficult for me. Uh, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I just, I, I just can't seem to get over. Um, the man is down on me. All manner of excuses that are thrown out there. It just produces laziness and entitlement. But as believers, this is not to be named amongst us. And those who are walking in this idleness, this laziness, we're to keep away from those brothers. Now, I, I, I appreciate. Um, the kindness of God in verse 10. Where it says, For even when we were with you, we would give you this command. If anyone is not willing to work. I think that, that there's something there. Because there are men who are unemployed and they don't want to be. They are going out. They're, ser- they're seeking for work. They're, they're, they're doing what they can. They want to provide for their families or they're single. And they say, you know what? Just because I'm single, I don't have a family to provide for me. Doesn't mean I just want to spend my days sitting on the couch playing video games or just, you know, wasting my time. I want to work. There's a desire in them to work and they're willing. And it may be that difficult times come. I remember when 
when I lost my job, and I, I, I came to Pastor Tim, I wasn't even a, a member here yet, but I, I, I told Pastor Tim, and he was telling me that, and hit, well, you could, I guess you could share your own uh, testimony of how you found things to do. You mowed lawns, and um, I remember when, when I was uh, without work, and I said, you know what? These, this place isn't hiring me. This place isn't hiring me. I went to that, that temporary job agency, five in the morning. Didn't know if I was going to get picked, but showed up there every morning. And uh, one day I was standing outside holding one of those uh, signs for a check cashing place. And it was, it was a humbling thing, but at the end of the day I said, you know what, I worked. There's a, there's a, there's a difference between the man who does, is not willing to work and the man who is willing to work, but as it, as it stands at this time, they're not finding work. Let me, let me just interject right there. Um, don't you believe that if you have a man out of work and he's one of God's children, don't you believe that if he's capable of working, that he has an absolute promise from God that God will give him work? Don't you believe that? I mean, do you believe that there's... Do you believe that there's any situation where God would let one of his children who truly wants to work and is asking God to give him a job that he would just leave him out of work for seven years? I don't think so. I mean, now look, the, the rest of the world doesn't have that promise, but all the promises of God are ours. And, and the truth is, if God wants us working, listen, will not God always give the grace to do what he expects? And when he tells us to redeem the time, will he not give us the grace to do that very thing? The, the truth is, there isn't a Christian man on the face of this earth. I know when we get Christians in here, they may lose their jobs. Sometimes it's necessary. You know, sometimes it's a tremendous learning experience, a very humbling experience. It helps you to get a different perspective on things. Maybe it helps you to have compassion on others in the future that then lose their jobs and are in our situations where... You know, they're financially pressed. I mean, there's, there's certainly reasons why God would allow us to lose a job. But I don't believe there's any Christian man willing to work with the promises we have in this book who should live life any other way than to expect. Now, that, that doesn't mean you kick back in the lazy boy and just think the phone's going to ring. you got to do like my brother did there and show up for day labor and be there early enough to get a job. You don't come waltzing in like 6 p.m. like they did in the vineyard there and think that the master of the vineyard's just going to come and put you to work for, I guess it was 5 p.m. probably, put you to work for an hour and pay you a full day's salary. That's, that's a parable, folks. Don't, don't, don't develop your work ethic based on that parable. It's meant to teach a different truth, not one about work. But, I mean, if you put the legwork into it, you're willing to work, and sometimes willing to work a different kind of job than what you, you know, we've got to be ready to work the kind of work that the Lord brings us. But I've always found this, if you're faithful in a little, then God will bring you more. Amen. Um, no, speak, speaking about work ethic, I think is huge because, okay, you can have a job and still be idle <laughs> and still be lazy and still not be working in a way that is honoring to the Lord. And if you look at worship, work as worship to God, it gives you a completely different perspective Regardless of the job you're doing, you know, you, you may be cleaning toilets or you may be a CEO. At the end of the day, if you are working as unto the Lord, that's worship to God. Um, turn, turn to Colossians chapter 3, 23. So, you know, now, now that, we, that, the, that the precedent has been set that work is not a consequence of the fall, it's actually evidence that we truly are created in the image of God, and now we see that idleness is completely out of, the, out of the question, and this mentality of entitlement is forbidden, and working is a, is a, is a, is a thing that 
should be imitated and that we should do to be an example. Before you jump text, I would just stress that disassociation mentioned in 2 Thessalonians 3 is equal to the kind of disassociation when somebody falls into sexual sin, drunkenness. Our church has not yet disciplined anybody for not working. And I don't know of any church who practices discipline who has. Bethany, did you, has your church ever, do you know of any church? Um, but it is certainly a biblically valid reason to do it. And, and maybe one of the reasons is that in, a, in most of our churches, people are relatively hard workers. But, um, but I can tell you this, and, and this is part of a learning curve. I don't just chalk this up to huge amounts of sin. I, I, chalk, it up, I chalk it up some to we have people being converted, some out of families where, where welfare and entitlement have become a relative norm. And you know what? When people get involved in that system, it's kind of like drug abuse. You know, you, can't, you don't want to just fault people. You want to teach people. You want to help them out of that. And, and one thing is, we, we also have um, lots of young people. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll on, on a fairly regular basis over the last year, we have very healthy 20-something-year-old young men who will approach typically Carlos, who is our treasurer, and they'll want money to help them out of some situation they got into. Their car broke down, or they can't pay the rent, or they can't pay some type of utility bill. And I'll tell you right uh, straight up, 1 Timothy 5 says that the church shouldn't even be burdened for widows if there's family who can take care of that. And it means somebody who's able to work and provide for their family. And if we've got a 20-something-year-old, you know what Carlos and I would tell them? You need to work out of your situation. It doesn't matter if you've missed rent, you're facing eviction, you've got back charges, you're overdue, you're in the hole, and the collection agencies are coming. You're a young man. Go work. The, the, the truth is, if you will work, you can work right out of bad situations. I was in a rotten financial situation when God saved me, and I worked out of it. And, you know, Carlos and I will talk. When, we, when suddenly our financial system in our family breaks down, like I can tell you, I was not expecting to hit a deer just recently and cost me $1,700. But it doesn't even come into my mind to go talk to Carlos about having the church pay for that. In fact, if anything, I think, I think well, maybe there's, you know, maybe there's a way if I needed to, maybe there's a way to do some work or somehow bring in some extra income, but not to tax the church for it. Work. Work is the way out. We need that mentality. Now, obviously, there are some people who can't work, and there are some people, there are women with children, or there's widows, and they don't have providers, and the church definitely needs to be sensitive to that. But I can tell you right up, no, no healthy 20-something-year-old young man needs to ever come to Carlos asking for a handout. You can do it, but you're going to basically get the, the sermon that I just gave you in short form. You're going to get it in long form, and, uh, and rightly so. I mean, if we can work and if we're healthy and able to work, that's God designed us to work. You're able to work, and I know... I know there's guys that say, well, you know, I put, I, put in an, I put in an application over there and I'm waiting to hear back. What do you mean you're waiting to hear back? Uh, you did that how long ago? Well, I did that 10 days ago and I'm waiting to hear. You know, there is day labor here. And what I found when I was in college and I moved out to Colorado for a summer, I went to day labor and I got a, I got a job 
every time I went there. And you know what? I was offered that job, the second job I got, I was offered it full time. And I told him, I can't, I'm moving back to Michigan. But if you, if you do day labor long enough and you do it well enough, somebody's going to offer you a full time position. It still may not be the kind of work that you want to do, but you know what? Beggars can't be choosers a lot of times. I mean, if you, if you don't have a job, you've got to start somewhere. Be faithful, work hard, be diligent, and people will take notice and you'll get promoted or you'll get better jobs or you'll move up. But you've got to be a hard worker. And lo lounging around in bed because you put in one application isn't going to get it. So, on the heels of that, Colossians 3, 22. Now, this was written to slaves. So, you being an employee, how much more so? Slaves, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service, as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Okay. Eye service. Everybody knows what that means, right? That means the boss is coming around the corner. They see you, so you start working. They leave, you stop working. You know they're coming. You heartily do it, you leave, and then you're on your phone texting. That's eye service. You're only giving them service when their eyes are on you. Not that way. That's not the way that the Christian works. As people pleasers, not even to please them, but how? Fearing, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. Now, you can think of a plethora of reasons for why you would do anything for the Lord. I mean, God is holy. He is beautiful. You were lost in a pit of sin. He sent his son who lived perfectly. He died upon a cross taking your wrath and shame. He shed his own blood. He rose from the dead. He gives you eternal life and his righteousness. You will be forever with him. I mean, isn't this motivation to worship him? It is. And this is the motivation that you can do your work heartily with sincerity of heart, as unto him. I mean, that, that's a beautiful thing, that even if you do the most menial, seemingly tedious, you're on an assembly line, you feel like this is completely meaningless, I'm wasting my day here. The Bible says that you do this as unto the Lord. That's worship. This, this seemingly meaning, meaningless task has just become eternally benefiting. It has just become glorious. It has just become worship unto the holy, holy, holy King of kings and Lord of lords. you flipping a burger. And you do it in such a way that whether the boss is watching or not, you're doing it as unto the Lord because your boss isn't always going to be there. But the eyes of the Lord are always upon you. And the kindness that he has shown to you is ever-present. So you always have inspiration and motivation to work with a sincere heart, fearing the Lord. As worship to God. And uh, if, if you turn over to First Peter, even if your boss is wicked and cruel... <laughs> 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 18. And the inspiration is the same. It focuses on Christ. You, you, you take your mind off of this, this job that is so difficult. You're outside. You're sweating. You're inside. You're freezing. You're... Verse 18, chapter 2, 1 Peter. 
Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. Have you ever had an unjust boss? Have you ever had a, a boss that just treated you unjustly, unfairly? It says you're to be respectful to them. For this is a gracious thing when mindful of who? God. See, the mind that is set on God. Even an unjust boss, your respect to them becomes a gracious thing. When, when mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called. Because, see, again, right back to Christ. Because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin Neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. The gospel is the help for you on your job. When you're working, your boss is being cruel and unjust to you. You're being treated unfairly. They're giving all this this, this kindness and extra benefits and bonuses and all this stuff to these other people who have not been working as hard as you and you know it's unjust. You still treat them with respect and kindness. You love your enemies. And what is your help to do this? Christ. For Christ did no wrong but was treated wrong. Christ did no reviling but was reviled. And what did Christ do? He entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. He knew God will deal with this properly. Never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for I will repay, says the Lord. Having that heart, you're going in. I am working as worship unto my God, for Christ is beautiful and he's infinitely worthy of all of my labor. I mean, isn't it true that if Christ came down in physical form and said, I want you to do something for me, you would say, anything, Lord, anything, what do you want me to do? And he says, I want you to work at this job with all your might. Oh, you would do it in a heartbeat. You would do it with a smile on your face. He has said here for us to do this. And I... I, I, uh, I'll pass it to you after this. There's just an example in uh, Genesis of one who did this, I think, in, in such a way, which is uh, Joseph. You know, I, I think Joseph was, was a, a wonderful example of what this looks like. Genesis chapter 39. Now Joseph, verse 1, now Joseph had been brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer to Pharaoh, the captain of the guard, an Egyptian, had bought him from the Ishmaelites who had brought him down there. Now remember, Joseph was not in that situation because of any just thing. He was there unjustly. He was sold by his brothers, a captive, an illegal slave, sold. And he was bought. Verse 2, the Lord was with Joseph and he became a successful man and he was in the house of his Egyptian master. His master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord caused all that he did to succeed in his hand. So Joseph found favor in his sight and attended him and he made him overseer of his house and put him in charge of all that he had from the time that he made him overseer in his house and over all that he had, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. The blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in house and field. So look at this. So he left all that he had in Joseph's charge, and because of him, he had no concern about anything but the food he ate. Now, if you work 
in such a way as worship unto the Lord with the gospel motivating you, Christ before your eyes. You work in such a way. Imagine where your boss can leave and say, I leave everything in your hands. I'm not concerned about anything that goes on here because I know you're on the job. I know you're behind it. I know your hands are on it. So I know that it will be taken care of in a great way. What kind of witness is that to a lost and dark world for Christ? I mean, as a Christian, shouldn't we be the ones who are first on the job, punctual? We're the ones who are not complaining. We're not gossiping about the boss with everyone else. We're not standing by the water cooler, as it were, and talking about how much this job is just worthless. I don't want to be here. And and on Facebook and complaining, oh, I can't wait till Friday. Like, we should be the ones who are being a great example to everyone else, all of our lost co-workers as followers of Christ. Certainly you're, you're there and you're telling people you're a Christian. Maybe you have your, your Bible out and, you know, you do some uh, evangelism when uh, liberty allows and you're not, you know, violating the company's policy there. But if they see, oh, this man's a Christian, but he's late to work, he's lazy, he doesn't come in here, he doesn't want to work, he only works when the boss is around, that, that, that's, that's not going to bring glory to our Father in heaven. In fact, that would cause them, the Gentiles to blaspheme the name of our Lord. So I would encourage that, you know, keep the gospel close. As uh, Spurgeon said, I love that quote, dwell where the cries of Calvary may be heard. If you, you live close, you remember what Christ has done for you and your work as meaningless as it seems, is accepted by the Lord as worship. Well, that's an encouragement. You just think about the point in time chronologically when that voice came from heaven and said, You are my Son in whom I am well pleased. Where'd that happen? It, it happened at the beginning of his public ministry. We heard Peter say, no sin. You think, you think about the Father saying, my son in whom I'm well pleased. 30 years of life. Much of it spent as a carpenter. One of, the, one of the things that oftentimes people feel like, well, if I don't get into the ministry and I don't do this certain ministry, but you know, that's really that well-pleasing remark of the Father is a cumulative assessment of the life of His Son coming out of obscurity as a carpenter. No sin. He could be a carpenter and go to his trade and do it with this kind of mindset we just heard about. And it's perfect. And God is perfectly pleased. Some people think if I'm not in the ministry, God isn't going to be pleased. I can't really do anything. I can't really accomplish anything. But you know, if you, if you do the kind of things that we're called to do. You're worse than an infidel. You're worse than an unbeliever if you don't take care of those of your own household. You should work to do that. And God is very pleased when you do that. Uh, one of the texts that is um, spoken as well to the Thessalonians, not in the second letter, but in the first one, it says this, work with your hands as we instructed you so that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. Work so as to walk properly. If the outsiders, here's what this means. Who are outsiders? Unbelievers. For you to walk properly, you work with your hands. It doesn't say you have to give up everything you do with your hands and go into the ministry. That's true. Some are called to that. But even men like Paul who were called to it often gave up their liberty to not work with their hands, again, not to be a bad testimony to the outsiders who are watching, sometimes to insiders who are watching. But for outsiders, don't, 
if you claim, you know what, if you're lazy, close your mouth with telling your neighbors you're a Christian. Don't tell your family. Don't tell people and then live some sluggardly life. Don't go into work and, and boast about Christ and then be an eye pleaser who every time the boss comes... Look, if you're an eye pleaser, you get caught all the time. Because you don't know when the boss is coming. And all you have to do is be a boss, be a foreman, be, be in charge somewhere, be a manager, and you walk around the corner and you see the people that immediately jump back to work. Don't call yourself a Christian and live that kind of life. It's sad. I can, I can remember one time working for John Seitzma, and he, he, ba- you know, he, he had to admit that the majority of people from the church, not this one, but the one that I was at then with him, that he hired were the worst workers. Lost people outperformed the Christians, the professing Christians. What a sad testimony. Before the outsiders, we should work. We should be the best. They may not like us because we're Christians. And they may not like our Christ. We'll be hated of all nations for His sake. They may hate you because of Christ. They may hate you because of your message. They may hate you because you point out their sin. But don't ever let them hate you or have reason to find fault with you because you don't tow your weight in the company because you're the weak link. Don't ever, Christian, don't ever let unbelievers outperform you. I mean, if it's an IQ thing and you're doing all you can, or you know, you got a bum leg or something, and the reason others outperform you is just because you don't have the physical strength or you don't have the mental IQ to keep up with them. Well, I mean, I understand that. But don't ever let it be because you're lazy because, because don't let it be a fault with you that it would happen. Now, I want to just end with this. Because, because we really, I, I think we need to spearhead this thing a little bit deeper. Do you know, when I was lost, I, I stole a lot of things. And I think I told my son before. Joshua, if I'd have known God was going to save me and I was going to have to go return all that stuff or go pay for it, I said, I guarantee you, I'd have never done it in the first place. I mean, I determined after God saved me to make restitution for th- things I vandalized and destroyed. My friends and I, I mean, we were drunk and tore up golf or golf course greens and I mean, it was just a bunch of crazy stuff and skipped out on rent and places and various things that I'm definitely not proud of. But you know, somebody could, somebody could come along to me and uh, they could just quote the Ten Commandments. Thou shall not steal. But you know, basically the truth that we have in the New Testament Paul comes along and he says, we have, a, we have a man over here, like myself, used to steal. Not just, thou shall not steal. Let, remember last week? This works in prayer, works in fasting. It w- really works in all the foundational matters that we have dealt with and we'll, we're going to deal with. And it's that text. What a text. There in Matthew 5.20, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees, you will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. When we fast, when we pray, we don't want to be like the hypocrites. And when we work, it's the same. You know, Paul as a Pharisee, he could say, I didn't steal. When it came to the law, blameless. Rich young ruler, what good work do I have to do to obtain eternal life? 
Well, Jesus said, keep the commandments. He said, which ones? And he gave him some, and he said, well, I've kept those. I've kept those. Undoubtedly, if you'd have said, don't steal, he'd have said, I, I haven't stolen since my birth. And you know, it would pr- probably in an outward sense, it would have been true. Just like with Paul, when it came to the law, blameless, externally. But that's, you got you to gotta do better than that. Jesus is saying, your righteousness better exceed what a Pharisee is capable of. And so he says, don't don't live like the Gentiles any longer. This isn't the way you learn Christ. If indeed you have learned of him, he says, you don't walk in as an old man anymore. You walk like a new man. We walk, we're regenerated people. We're not just like the Pharisees. We're not like the hypocrites that just do everything externally. There's a heart matter here. And when it comes to this whole thing, he says to these Ephesians, you got some thieves among you? Let the thief steal no more. And then he takes it even further. He says, work with your hands. And then he even takes it further so that you may have something to share with those that are in need. Now you think with me here. Why did I, why did I steal? Not typically, I didn't steal because I needed food. I'd stole to get stuff that I didn't have money for. My friend stole a radar detector for me because I wanted one on my motorcycle because I didn't want to get tickets. He worked at Kmart or somewhere. He stole it for me. I paid, it for, paid him for it. That was one of the things I had to make restitution for. I didn't tell them who he was. I just said, just told them the story without using names and I paid for it. You steal to have. You steal to have what you don't want to work for, Right? I could have worked for that. I was an engineering student. Probably I w- would have waited long enough till I got my first job. I'd have been able to pay for that easy enough. I probably, after I was an engineer, I think I bought several of them. But I wanted then what I didn't have money to buy, so I stole. That's why people steal, typically. And then you take it, you know, then you go further. Well, we would say, Isn't it a pretty honorable thing to work so that we can have? But you know, there's a lot of hardworking people. I typically pray various times during the week over at Brackenridge, and I walk through I walk through a somewhat Alamo Heights kind of neighborhood over there, and I see a bunch of rich people. They live in this neighborhood where I walk through sometimes. They're not Christians. Most of them had Obama signs in their yard not long ago. They're liberal. They're God-hating, probably, most of them. But they have wealth. And I don't know. You know, they may have stole. I don't know. But a lot of times, they're, they're hard workers. They worked. They're no better than the Pharisees. Just because we work hard to get doesn't make us work. Hard work is good. But you know, under the Gospel, as Christians, this isn't just about... Do you see? It's not just about do I steal to get versus do I work to get. Do you see that? That's not, that's, as a new man, it doesn't stop there. The Pharisee can do that. You know, the tax collector extorts. The Pharisee thinks he's better because he doesn't steal. A lot of people are hard workers who work to have. And they're greedy and they're covetous and they work and work and work so that they can get money, so that they can have houses and cars and stuff. And one guy steals to have 
And we all look at him and he's the low life and we think how much more highly respectable of the guy who works to have. But I'm telling you, that is not where you want to stop as a Christian. Because what the apostle does is he takes it even a step further. He says, the Christian thing to do is to work with your hands so that you can give. You can steal to have, and you can work to have, or you can work to give. And that's what we see. We're working to give. Work to support your family and give to them. And work to give to those who are in need. Work with your hands so that you can share when you see that there's needs I mean, I really believe young Christians, you need, th- this needs to be something that needs to be a guiding principle to your lives. You're young and you feel like, well, I just need to get a job so that I can pay for my stuff. I mean, one of the things is, I think, I think some of the young people that are coming to Carlos because they're getting. They're back in a corner financially. They're coming. They're young. They can work. And not only are they not working their way out of their own financial holes, they're probably not really even thinking about working to give. And I'm going to really refrain from going to the Proverbs right now because we're going to deal with that next week. But I think, well, I know that there is a proverb that expressly says that you end up worse off financially if you don't give what you ought to give. And remember this whole thing. Jesus Christ is telling us to store up treasure in heaven. And how do you do that? You do that by working and giving to people who are in need. And I mean, we need to be, we need to be wise and assess what need is. The guy that stands at the, at the stop sign on the exit ramp off of the interstate who, who says God bless you on his sign and he wants work, but he really doesn't want work. He just wants you to hand him $5 and he's going to run right off and, and drink it down that night. That, that isn't a guy in need. We're really looking for people in need. Visiting widows and orphans in their infliction. It's that kind of thing. It's what you find over there in Isaiah 53. It's you're really looking for people who are oppressed. You're really looking for people who are homeless. Destitute. And they got that way. Oftentimes they got that way because of no fault of their own. And even sometimes when people do get places because of their own fault. I mean, God showed us great mercy in delivering us from where we were. We don't want to just give to people who we think are worthy because there aren't a whole lot of worthy people in the world. But certainly some more so. And certainly certainly the needs of those of the household of faith. I mean, we are told in Luke 12 that we should be selling our possessions and giving to those in need. In Matthew 6, we're told to be storing up treasure in heaven. Where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. And we have this reality that we should be not stealing. We should rather be working so that we can get, so that we can not accumulate, but so that we can give. George Mueller, do you know, the more he made, he never raised his standard of living. He went through his life And the more that came in, when he started out, not much came in. But you know, by the time he had five orphan houses, lots of money came in. In fact, so much money came in, he was one of Hudson Taylor's biggest supporters. And he never increased his standard of living. He just gave more and more and more. And some of you young people may be in the financial hardships you are in simply because you are not being faithful to this principle. You are consumed. You're not stealing. That's good. And you're working. 
And that's good. But you're not giving. And you need to. This is such, this, this is such a step of faith. When we work and we give, and we pay our debts, take care of your family. Be mindful of family needs. You got parents, watch their needs. Remember what the Pharisees did. They had parents in need and they didn't give to it. They called their money Corban. What is offered to God, they don't need to give to them. Just a way of not taking care of their parents. Jesus, Matthew 15 labeled that as as wickedness. It is sin. Watch your family for needs. Watch your spiritual family for needs. Oh, and I guarantee you, when you start giving to those in need, the promises of Isaiah 58 are yours. You, you cry, and it says, the Lord says, here I am. And it's, it's like, you are merciful, you work to give and to show mercy and to provide people's needs. And Isaiah 53 says, then you call if you're in need. It's just like God puts everything on hold and says, I'm here. What do you need? You have been merciful to others. I'm here. My ear is directed to you. What do you need? And I think sometimes the reason that some, sometimes the Lord is making some of you endure some real economic hardships at times is because you're very selfish and self-centered with the use of your money. Think about others. This is exactly what Paul's calling us to do. Let the thief no longer steal. Let him work with his hands what is good. Don't do evil things with your hand. Don't work in a bar. Work that which is good with your hands. Be a hard worker at that which is good so that you have something to share with those that are in need. This is right in the context of life as the new man. The way we learn Christ. This is what Christ did. Christ worked. And He worked. He worked out an obedience that He would impute to us for our righteousness. And He worked And he worked in prayer. And he worked for the lost. He worked in that carpenter's shop. And then he worked in his ministry. And he worked it without a shade of sin. He worked and he worked and he worked. By the sweat of his brow, he worked. Weary, worn out. And yet there's a soul there at Jacob's well. Weary. And he didn't give in to laziness. He had to be there. There was a soul He came to save. In fact, a number of Samaritans that were His people, lost sheep, that He worked and He worked. He worked a righteousness that He could impute to them, but He also worked to get to where they were. Weary as He was, He went to sinners, constantly going, constantly going. The cross looming before Him. Dread upon His soul, and yet He kept going. Sweating blood, and He kept going. He pressed through in obedience all the way to the end. What an example for us. One who worked for the sake of others. And that's what we're called to. Your righteousness has to exceed that of the Pharisees. Don't just work to satisfy your own greed and covetousness. Work to share. Work to love. Work to visit those in need, the widow, the orphan, the missionary, those that are laboring in the gospel to support them. This is, this is worthy. I'll tell you this. You never go into ministry. You work your whole life as a carpenter or an electrician or a plumber. You work your whole life digging ditches, laying road as an engineer or as a doctor or as a nurse or as an accountant, as a secretary, as a mother, as a teacher. 
You live your whole life and you pour yourself into it. Doing service to God. Just giving yourself. Giving yourself. So that you can help others and give to others and share to others. And you do that as unto the Lord. It is a life well spent. And you, re- you just remember, 30 years of Christ's life was lived. Obscure, off the scene, with tools in His hand. And His Father could look at Him and say, perfect. Your life doesn't need to be subpar because you feel like you're a janitor. You can be a janitor and live your life to where you hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Where many lawyers and doctors will hear, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. Work as unto the Lord. Work as worship to Him. Well, God help us, brethren. Any last word? Lord, give us a spirit to work. Give us a determination to work. Give us a church that works as unto You. Not as unto men. Not as eye-pleasing folks. Oh Lord, may we work to store up treasure in heaven. May we work as unto the Lord who bought us. May we work worthy of Him who shed His blood. May we work to give. Work to share. Work to to enter in to the burdens of others. Lord, may it be so. Give us grace that it might be so. Amen.